Well, you may not be aware, but the Republican Party had a convention this past week. I know that may come as a surprise to you, but it really did happen. And you probably should have paid more attention to it because you helped pay for it. Just as with the Democratic Convention, you and other Americans plowed $14 million into this infomercial, this extravaganza, this gala, this fate, whatever it is, where a bunch of people got up on the platform and told us what a wonderful man George W. Bush is and how unsafe we would be today if it weren't for George W. Bush and how evil and dirty and slimy are those Democrats who oppose George W. Bush. Well, I'm not a masochist, so... I didn't watch the Republican convention. I didn't tune in one evening. But one evening late, when I had finished work and I was sitting having a sandwich in the living room watching television and just surfing around looking for something, I happened on to a news channel called Fox TV News. And there was Greta Van Sustern giving a wrap-up for that evening's Republican convention activities. That was Tuesday evening. And there were a number of interesting things that I saw. One was that Rush Limbaugh, was on the telephone being interviewed by Greta Van Sustern. Rush Limbaugh, that giant, well, I won't say the word, the fellow who is a cheerleader for the Republican Party. And during the course of the interview, I heard him say to Greta Van Sustern, in defense of all that George Bush has done, he made the statement, America was minding its own business before 9-11. America was minding its own business before 9-11. Now, that really is an amazing assertion. I guess Rush Limbaugh is not aware of the CIA's overthrowing of the Iranian government in 1953, which installed the brutal Shah, who was so oppressive and disturbed the Iranians so much that when they got rid of him in the late 70s, they took over the American embassy in 1979 and took hostage all the employees of the embassy in order to get back at America for what it had done in overthrowing the only democratic government in the Arab world. And in fact, the only democratic government to this day in the Arab world. And when George Bush talks about bringing democracy to the Middle East, maybe he should notice that it was America that withdrew the only democracy that existed in the Middle East. But getting back to Rush Limbaugh, is he oblivious? to American interference in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Haiti, the Dominican Republic? Uh, is he unaware that we have troops in Colombia and that we have planes there that are shooting down people who are suspected to be drug dealers and don't always turn out to be drug dealers? Is Rush Limbaugh unaware of the troops that have been stationed in Mecca in the Saudi Arabian uh, Peninsula there since 1991? Is he aware that of all the support that has been given to Israel? Is he aware of all the money that's being given and has been given to brutal dictators in Pakistan and other countries? Is he aware of the fact that 140 governments in the world are getting money from the United States, many of them oppressive regimes? Did he sleep through the intervention in Somalia or the bombing of Serbia or the kidnapping of Manuel Noriega from Panama, brought up to Florida, tried on charges and put in an American prison? Does he not know about the aiding of Suharto's slaughter of tens of thousands of Indonesians and Timorese back in the 70s? Does he not even know about the support given to Saddam Hussein in his war against Iran in the 1980s? Does he not even know about the war against Saddam Hussein in 1991? Does he not know anything about what's going on in the world? Is he unaware that the U.S. military has 720 bases in over 100 countries around the world? Oh, my. I don't know how anyone could say that America was minding its own business before 9-11. Well, I know you were minding your own business, and I like to think I was minding my own business. But the American government was not minding its own business. And the interesting thing about all this is that Rush Limbaugh is the source by which millions of American conservatives apparently get their information. And now a lot of them will go off and tell their spouses and their friends and their business associates, you know, America was minding its own business before 9-11, and those people who came over here and struck at the United States had no reason whatsoever except because they didn't like our freedom, our democracy, and our prosperity. As Charlie Reese said a month or two ago, that's the most stupid explanation of 9-11 that is imaginable. And the stupid explanation of the suicide bombers that are acting up in Iraq these days. As Charlie said, can you imagine? Somebody suddenly stands up and says, you know, I hate freedom. I just absolutely hate freedom, and so I'm going to go blow myself up. No, I don't think so. But this is how people want to frame the argument. 
They want to believe that American foreign policy is not on the table. Even the people on the left today do not attribute, at least not very many of them, attribute 9-11 to American foreign policy. They say if you want to fight terrorism, you've got to do it by eradicating poverty throughout the world. Well, eradicating poverty is about as stupid an idea as trying to eradicate terrorism. You cannot just go off and spend a bunch of money and eradicate poverty any more than you can go off and kill a bunch of people and er eradicate terrorism. When you steal money from people and then descend upon other people with great quantities of money, all you do is subsidize poverty, which makes it unnecessary for people to pull themselves out of poverty. And so poverty remains. And when you go kill people to stop terrorism, all you do is recruit more terrorists. Another big star at the Republican convention was Rudolph Giuliani. I have to say that I believe that George W. Bush is not the most overrated man in America today because there are plenty of people who do not like him, some who hate him, some who laugh at him, so I would not call him overrated. But Rudolph Giuliani has to be the most overrated person in America today. Greta Van Susteren the other night referred to him as everybody's mayor. Rush Limbaugh, over the phone in their conversations, called him the nation's mayor, and I've heard him referred to as America's mayor. Well, i got to tell you, that he is not my mayor. First of all, he is so glorified today because he just happened to be the mayor of New York City when New York City was attacked by two planes going into the World Trade Center. Now, I'm not going to tell you that a good mayor would have prevented those attacks. It really had nothing to do with him. But all he did was go down to ground zero, congratulate the police and the firemen, and go to their funerals when they died, and suddenly he's a national hero. What did he do? He didn't do anything. He didn't show great courage in any way. He didn't show great leadership. He didn't do anything to merit this other than being the mayor of New York City. Now, if that were all there were to it, then all I would say is that he isn't what people think that he is. But it's more than that. He is a lot that people do not realize. Before he got into elective politics, running for mayor of New York City, he was a U.S. attorney for many, many years. I think it runs into the decades. And during the 1980s, he decided that he could create great publicity for himself if he started going after white-collar crime, specifically people in the investment world. And he is the one who went into a New York investment banking office and took two investment bankers off the trading floor, handcuffed them, accompanied by photographers from several newspapers, and the next day, Newspapers all over America had pictures of these two men being let out of their office in handcuffs as though they were dangerous criminals and had to be handcuffed and let out by police officers carrying guns to make absolutely sure that they did not get away. This image was then repeated in Oliver Stone's movie, Wall Street. And that's where it came from. Giuliani ordered that raid on the New York Investment Banking House. What only one person in a million, probably, in America knows is that the two men whose lives were ruined by being let out of their office in handcuffs, were later cleared completely in federal courts when the cases were thrown out and the prosecutors were lectured to by the judge for bringing such a ridiculous case into his court. But then Giuliani went after a company called Princeton Newport, and he staged another big media raid, got photographers there, and had 50 federal marshals outfitted with automatic weapons and bulletproof vests raided Princeton Newport, and arrested a bunch of people. And, of course, the impression that he was giving the public was that mobsters and gangsters and hardened criminals were operating in the financial area of New York. Uh, it was absolutely ridiculous. But his biggest prize was Michael Milken. And if you're old enough to remember the 1980s, then you remember Michael Milken as the jump bond king, as the personification of evil in the financial world. Well, of course, there is absolutely no evidence that Michael Milken ever created, uh, committed any kind of crime, any more than there is that Martha Stewart committed any kind of crime. All that happened was that Giuliani charged Milken with, what was it? I've got the number here someplace. Charged him with something like 168 crimes. The indictment, yeah, the indictment had 160 counts to 198 counts. I'm sorry. And so the pressure built up so that Milken had to finally plea bargain to six minor technical infractions. Now, if Giuliani really had a case with 190 counts, he would have never settled for six minor technical infractions. But he did, because he had no case against Milken. And later, when Milken was in court testifying on another case, the judge asked what it was that he had done to put, him in, to put Milken in prison. And when it was recounted, the judge said, well, he hasn't committed any crimes whatsoever. 
And this whole thing was admitted by Giuliani's assistant, a U.S. attorney named John Carroll, who gave a lecture at Seton Hall Law School in April 1992. And he said there, quote, We're guilty of criminalizing technical offenses. Many of the prosecution theories we used were novel. Many of the statutes that we used to charge hadn't been charged as crimes before, end of quote. Now, you think he was making a great confession here. He wasn't. He was boasting. He was boasting that they had twisted the law in order to get somebody into prison. And he was saying, in effect, that they made up the laws that they accused Milken of breaking. And then, once having made up new laws, they applied them retroactively against Milken. He was very proud of what he had done. And he went on to say that they were looking for other areas where they could ensnare people by reinterpreting routine behavior as crimes. And that's exactly what has happened. Insider trading was never thought to be a crime. Nobody ever thought that there was anything wrong with it. It has been going on for a 100 years. Technical analysts have been using it to chart the market. And yet, suddenly it was redefined as a crime about 20 years ago. And we've been talking about everybody's mayor, Rudolph Giuliani. And let me wind that up so we can get to the phones. The Giuliani... U.S. Attorney's Office, which was based in New York, went after a whole number of people in the financial world, charged them with, in some cases, hundreds of counts in an indictment, and then finally got them to plea bargain to a handful, just as they did with Michael Milken. Very, very, very few of Giuliani's targets were ever actually convicted in a trial, but he just made it simply so difficult for them that they felt they had no choice but to plea bargain. Giuliani himself bragged that what he would do is to get the media to paint the target of his investigation so black that the person felt that he had no chance to get a fair trial because everybody on the jury would have heard about him by reading the New York Times or whatever. In fact, he, Giuliani himself, said, the media does the job for me. So this is the man who is considered everybody's mayor, who walked into a situation on 9-11 where he could be considered a great hero in this country. And I remember one night watching David Letterman interview Rudy Giuliani, and Letterman was just falling all over Giuliani, and the subject came up about the funerals of the police and firemen who were killed in the process of trying to clean up the rubble there at Ground Zero. And Giuliani mentioned that he had been to the funeral of every one of them, uh, everyone who had died there, and Letterman said, well, that says it all for me, and then said, is there any way we can get around the two-term limitation that exists on the mayor's office in New York? In other words, is there any way we can break the law so that we can get you to be mayor for another four years? Well, fortunately, nothing was done about it. But I can almost guarantee that Giuliani will be one of the prime candidates for the Republican nomination in 2008, whether or not Bush wins this time. Because, of course, if Bush wins, supposedly he can't run again in 2008, although who knows uh, what kind of a legal system we will be under at that point. But presumably, Bush won't be able to run again. And if Bush loses, then they'll be looking for somebody new in 2008. And Giuliani is bound to be right up there center stage. Meanwhile, he's getting, I understand, $100,000 a pop to go out and speak to people and tell them about leadership, explain to them about leadership. All right, well, if, while you're explaining about leadership, Mr. Mayor, tell them how you blackjack people into prison during the 1980s. All right, enough of this ranting and raving. Let's get to something more sedate. Let's talk with Ken in South Carolina. Good evening, Ken. Hey, good evening, Mr. Brown. This is a, an honor. Um, I have to tell you, it's actually, you kind of ruined my life. About uh, four years ago, I was just... Well, I'm good at that. Go ahead. I, I tell you, I was this complacent, apathetic kind of guy. I hadn't voted in years. I was flipping around the, the channels one day with uh, watching TV with my wife, trying to find ESPN, and I saw you on C-SPAN, uh, on your little um, interview there, uh, when you were running for president, and I said, who is this guy? And I was listening to what you're saying. I've never heard anything like this. You changed my life. I've read all your books. You introduced me to uh, Richard Mayberry. You, you mentioned his name in one article. Uh, now I subscribe to his newsletter, and it's almost like I've gone from being this apathetic, who cares, nothing I can do about it, to actually caring about uh, you know, what's going on in this country. And I just I want to, I guess, thank you for that. It's become um, a really important part of my life. I write uh, letters to the editor. I call the uh, radio stations, and I think everyone thinks I'm a little bit crazy because uh, I'm about the only person that they hear from that says, hey, small government is something that's good. Well, I thank you for your kind words. Uh, my first question is, are you still married? I sure am. In fact, we just had our third child uh, two weeks ago. Which well, congratulations. Is thank you. And, uh, you know, the, the, thing about, the thing that's great about what, uh, you know, everything I've read about what you say, and listen, I, I've listened to your archive shows, is that it's impossible to lose a debate, whether it's with Republicans or Democrats, regarding politics, because what you say is so much common sense. And uh, you can basically argue anything by saying, hey, is it, is it the government's responsibility or role? based on the Constitution, to, to provide this to the public. And I still understand why people can't get that point. And they keep looking for government to solve every problem in their life. And, and I have to admit to you, I, I had student loans to get through school, and I didn't realize that it was probably hurting me more than it was helping me. And, and also hurting other people. Absolutely. So now I'm on to this, you know, Richard Mayberry, you're reading all his books, and, and simple rules don't encroach on other people or their, their, their person or their property. And you look around the world, and where we have problems is based on 
um, whether governments or other people are doing this, and it's so simple that you can answer almost any question based simply on that premise. And, you know, now at the conventions, the Republican and Democratic conventions, these guys are spending $40 million of our tax money for these basic chairman conferences, and very few people really understand this. And it's, I guess my point is, you know, a guy like Michael Badnarik, who I never really followed until um, I found out that he was uh, nominated for Liberty Libertarian President, I actually went on his uh, website, actually I went and downloaded his Constitution course, and he was very impressed. How do we get Michael Badnarik in the mainstream press, and guys like yourself and Richard Mayberry, to actually comment these guys like Kennedy and, and um, even Neil Boris, who, who some, he has a lot of things right, but he just he hits on this floor issue like, there's, like it's the only way to go. And, you know, having a couple of kids now, I'm not really interested in going to war or paying for it or having my, my children die in this well, according, according to George Bush, we're still going to be at war against uh, terrorism when your children are of draft age. Well, oh, absolutely. And, 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 you know, I guess, the, I guess this, there are so few people who really understand that. You know, maybe, you know, maybe it's a few 100,000 people in this country that understand it, but you almost have to just prepare for that and say, hey, you know, I'll make a little noise, but I'm not prepared for that. What am I going to do to protect my family and my children? And, and the fact that we're, you know, $7 trillion in debt and, you know, trillion mm-hmm. dollar a year deficits, which it's going to wind up being. Well, let me make a few comments. First of all, you're a very articulate fellow, so I think you're going to do very well. And secondly, we all thank you for what you're doing in writing letters to the editor and calling into talk shows. And uh, when you run up against this kind of a brick wall, uh, there are three things that you might keep in mind. Number one, government is force. And so when anybody says, well, the government should do this, uh, the answer is you mean people should be forced to pay for this whether or not they want to, or people should be forced to go along with this just like in any dictatorial country. Uh, is that what you mean? You know, make people face up to the fact that they're advocating force. Uh, do it in a gentle way. Don't do it to try to put them down, but just to call their attention to something they're overlooking. Secondly, uh, remember, government doesn't work. And when somebody says we need this program, just say, well, how do you think this is going to work any better than any of the other programs? And third, don't pay attention to what I've been saying the last 40 minutes. Be positive. Talk about the better world that would come without an income tax, with government minding its own business, and so on. With that lovely music by Franz Lehar and the Sex Pistols, we are back again. This is Harry Brown. Our phone number is 1-800-259-9231. And before we finish up with Ken, let me mention that I have posted on the Radio Links page a link to an article by Paul Craig Roberts covering some of Giuliani's crimes in the 1980. And I hate to be negative about Rudolph Giuliani, but somebody's got to do it. Anyway, uh, Paul Craig Roberts is a great investigative reporter, one of the best, and he has punctured a lot of holes in some of these so-called cases against the financial moguls of the country. And, of course, George Bush talks about them having cooked the books. Well, nobody cooks the books more than the federal government, including our beloved president and our beloved Congress. Anyway, if you go to my website, harrybrown.org, Right at the top, you'll see Radio Links page. Just click on there, and there are links to articles and websites mentioned on the broadcast, not just this week, but in previous weeks. We're talking with Ken in South Carolina. Ken, uh, sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, did you have some final thought? Uh, yeah, you said, I'm sorry to keep you so long, but um, just uh, actually two brief points. Number one, when you uh, eventually do retire and you're not doing this anymore, who else are we going to listen to or read um, that's going to... And keep us keep us in line because uh, you know what are we going to do when you're not there to kind of oh Ken I'm not ever going to retire and when I die I'm still going to be talking from the grave <laughs> so nobody's ever going to get rid of me but there are a lot of people around who are very articulate and we've got to get them on the radio and we've got to get them on television and if my television project works out then we, some of them will show up there and I think that that will provide a foothold that may make it possible for a number of television shows to get started that are much more libertarian. I can't promise that that will be the case, but it's very possible. And incidentally, a week ago, uh, last night, in other words, uh, a week ago Friday night, we did tape the pilot of the show, and it seemed to go well, but I can't really say until I see it, and I have not seen a tape of it yet. I probably will sometime this next week. And then over the next few weeks, the producer, Alan Mason, will be trying to sell the show to one of the national cable networks. And so I'm inviting everyone listening to this show to cross his fingers right now and give us your best hopes, and maybe we will succeed with this. We shall see. All right, Ken, thanks so much for calling. I really appreciate your, your kind words and also your enthusiasm about this. And let's go now to Clymer, New York, and talk with Roger. Good evening, Roger. Good, good evening, Harry. Thanks for taking my call. My pleasure. What's up? Well, I just wanted to tell you, um, you just don't understand the context of what Rush Bombast said. Yeah, <laughs> the, um, about you know, America it, minding its own business? Yeah, see, now, according to this government, it doesn't matter if it's a Republican or Democrat, any place in the world that anyone is doing anything or Anything in this country, it's the federal government's business. See, so therefore, by mining everybody's business, it's the federal government its own business. It's its own business. So, you, so you just have to understand the context of what he was saying. Well, that's true. We are living in 1984, and words mean what, uh, as it said in Alice in Wonderland, their words mean whatever I want them to mean. <laughs> see, see, 
that, that's the beauty of it. I mean, you know, we're supposed to be in the Middle East. We're supposed to have troops over there. We're supposed to take sides in, in conflicts between Israel and and its neighbors, or between Iraq and Iran, or between, um, you know, we're supposed between to... Between any two countries you want to name in the right, world. Right. We're, we're supposed to bomb an aspirin factory in Somalia. This was during the Clinton administration. We're supposed to invade Panama. Oh, yeah, I forgot, I forgot to mention the bombing of the Sudan and Afghanistan uh, in, that Clinton did. Right. But, but as a matter of fact, I forgot to mention a lot of interventions on the part of our government. Sorry to interrupt you, Roger. Okay, yeah. Anyway, I, I'm sending you an email now, and this just concerns um, the Infernal Revenue Service um, malfeasance. You would not believe this, this case. Okay, I look forward to it, and I'll mention it to the folks after I get it and uh, perhaps put it on the Radio Links page. Yeah, basically what it was was... This company, the IRS says if you're of a certain size, you have to set up a payroll account and then deposit your taxes, and we have to then withdraw them electronically, where before they used to send them to a bank. Mm -hmm. Well, this one company didn't do that, and you know, it's now law saying you have to do it. And so the, I, the IRS nailed them a penalty of X amount of dollars. Uh, and no one argued that the IRS didn't get their money on time. The IRS even said we got our money on time. We just didn't like the way we got it. Hmm. Now, the full thing was is the judge agreed with the IRS. Now, it's much like the, that campaign finance law. People sat there and said, well, it doesn't matter. The Supreme Court will throw it out. Well, if they don't, now you're stuck with it. Yeah, and in fact, the Supreme Court is likely to make it worse by adding some little thing on it that was, wasn't even there when Congress did, just as in the IRS case you're talking about. Thanks so much, Roger. Uh, call any time. And when we come back, we'll go to Massachusetts and talk there. Let's continue with the phone calls, talking now with Kayleen in Massachusetts. Good evening, Kayleen. Hello, my esteemed Mr. Brown. What's happening tonight? Well, I, first I have to compliment your first two callers, Ken and Roger. Ken brought up some very good points, and he did them very eloquently, and uh, Roger did them uh, facetiously, and uh, they, <laughs> they were both wonderful calls. Uh, I had a whole list of things I wanted to talk about, but listening to your um, monologue at the beginning, uh, talking about inside trading, it reminded me of an article that I read in Reason Magazine. I'm mm -hmm. sure you've heard of it. Of course. Uh, about doctors being sent to prison for prescribing pain medications, in particular OxyContin. Uh, for murder, for murder, up to eight years in prison for murder because they prescribed OxyContin to chronic pain patients, um, and the patients happened to overdose on them either accidentally or purposely. Uh, and these doctors have been dragged from their homes in handcuffs or dragged from their offices in handcuffs and sent to prison because they prescribed a pain medication that their patients badly needed, and the whole Hullabaloo was caused by, oh, well, uh, you know, illegal street um, drug dealers, which shouldn't happen anyway, as we all know. Well, would, I'm, would, I'm not sure I understand. Was the Oxydon, is that an illegal uh, substance? No, Oxycontin is a kind of release painkiller. It is uh, approved. Uh, it, it's a, yes, it's a, um, it's a legal uh, painkiller, which is a kind of release reform. Uh, Excuse me, a fine release form of oxycodone. I see, and uh, it's and just that the patients took too much of it, right. even though the doctor had prescribed a particular dosage that they didn't follow. Exactly, and, and so the been, doctors and have been doctors who've been dragged from their homes or dragged from their offices in handcuffs by the DEA for prescribing these medications because the patient would either accidentally or purposely overdose on them. And we're talking about cancer patients or any other kind of patients who are in chronic pain and needed this medication. And the, the whole thing about the insider trading. Uh, thing and people being dragged in handcuffs mm -hmm. with insider trading uh, brought that to mind. Sure. It's, uh, it's what, what we have here is a situation where the power exists, and so the prosecutors use that power in order to elevate their own careers by making new law, by going after people that had never been charged before with similar crimes. But we're just these people are just making it up as they go along. But the problem is not the people, it's the power. We Absolutely. must never give that power to people to be able to do those things. Uh, that music means we have to break for the news now. Thank you, Kayleen. Always glad to hear from you. This is Harry Brown. And before we go back to the phones, I would like to say a couple of words. Ken and I were talking earlier, and I said, be positive. And tonight I haven't been very positive, talking about the sins of Rudolph Giuliani and the ridiculousness of Rush Limbaugh. But let's just turn those things around for a moment. What would happen if America minded its own business? Number one, we would not be targeted by terrorists. Number two, your children would not fight and die in foreign wars. Number three, your children would not even be stationed in desert countries and other places. Now, I realize that sometimes when people are in the army, they want to be stationed in places like Germany or other countries that they might not otherwise see, but I don't think they really want to be stationed in the Sudan or in Iraq or Afghanistan or places like that. But even more than that, 
we would save tremendous amounts of money because America would be focused on defense. And that would mean that the military budget would be well under $100 billion a year, probably under $50 billion a year. That's all it would take to defend this country. The reason we are spending a half a trillion dollars on the military every single year is in order to be the world's greatest all-time national offense that can make mincemeat of any country in the world, that can pulverize any country into submission, into oblivion, in fact. And that simply is not necessary to defend this country. Fifty billion dollars spent on defense, and we would be many times safer than we are now spending a half a trillion dollars on offense. And as to these prosecutors, if our federal government would confine itself to the Constitution, you would never have to worry about a prosecutor making a name for himself, uh, padding his conviction record by hauling you into court on something that was never a law until they suddenly came up with some ingenious new reinterpretation of the law. Now, you may feel that these things don't apply to you, but you do. Just look at it this way. If they can get a billionaire like Michael Milken, think what they can do to somebody like you. Do you have a billion dollars? I didn't think so. And, of course, if the government stuck to the Constitution, there would be no federal laws against insider trading, against business practices, against these other things. We can take better care of ourselves as individuals. We can protect ourselves better from uh, fraud and these other things just simply by saying no when we're, satis when we're not satisfied that something is safe. When we give this power to government to do it, then what we also give them is the power to run roughshod over our lives. And I choose not to give them that power if I have anything to say about it. And, of course, if the government sticks to the Constitution, it means we don't need an income tax. It means you don't plunge 15% of your income into Social Security, a bankrupt, fraudulent retirement scheme. And perhaps most of all, for a better world, if we could just get government out of schooling, and I don't mean just the federal government, but all government out of schooling, so that there are no outrageous property taxes, which come to, in most states, six, seven, eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000 per family. And instead, spend that money as you choose in getting an education for your children, probably for more, no more than 2000 or $2,500 a child. And, of course, a far, far, far better education than they're getting now. And an education that doesn't require them to unlearn a great number of things about government and citizenship and the United Nations and being a world citizen or what it means to be an American citizen after they get out of school. Instead, they will learn how to think, learn how to be a good person and get out in the world and make a living for themselves that is perhaps going to be far greater because they have a, a far greater than it would be now because they have a more realistic view of what the world is. They have a more realistic view of how the market works. They have a more realistic view of what you have to do to get people to give you money. And that they do not learn in government schools. What they learn in government schools is what you would expect, how great the government is and how much the government takes care of us. So there is a better world available to us. And we must think positively and we must talk positively to people. Yes, we rant and rave sometimes, or at least I do. <laughs> I don't know about you. But the fact of the matter is that the best approach that we have to other people is to talk to them about how much better the world could be, how much better America could be, how much better your community could be, how much better society could be. And as I said to Ken, the other two things to keep in mind always, is number one, government is force. And when somebody praises some government program, Ask them if they really think that this is something that must be organized by force, where people who have no interest in this program must go without their cherished hopes and dreams for their own family in order to pay for something that the individual you're talking to thinks is such a great idea. And secondly, the, my all-time great favorite, government doesn't work. It just simply doesn't ever deliver on its promises. So why in the world would anybody want to ask the government to do something new, to do something further? And why in the world would anybody stake their hopes and dreams on government to do away with abortion, to clean up corporate America, to do any of these things when government never achieves anything that it says it's going to do? Why would they hope to make a drug-free America via the government, which has been trying to do so for 40 years and has done nothing but escalate drug use in America? Why would they try to wipe out poverty by turning to the government when government has had almost 40 years at that and has done nothing but to expand the number of people that are considered under the poverty line in America. Why in the world would anybody turn to government when government has such a sorry record? And on the other hand, what a wonderful record liberty has in bringing the blessings of prosperity, the blessings of freedom, the blessings of civility, the blessings of harmony. Whether you're talking about race relations, whether you're talking about generational relations, whether you're talking about making a living, whether you're talking about reducing crime, it is the blessings of liberty that make it possible. And we want to expand those blessings to everyone and every group in America. 
But let me quickly take uh, some emails. Jerry was kind enough to let me know by email that oxycontin that Kayleen mentioned, oxycontin is a Schedule II equivalent of heroin. And he says Schedule II is basically one step away from being completely illegal. But it is legal under a doctor's supervision, I presume. And Jerry says it's highly regulated by the federal government. It's what Rush Limbaugh got caught buying illegally. Jerry also says, I missed the first 15 minutes of your show. Did you get a chance to talk about Zell Miller? <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, don't get me started on Zell Miller. I didn't see him, but watching the Daily Show, they had a really good time making fun of Zell Miller. And uh, he, his speech was just off the wall. They talk about Pat Buchanan's speech in 1992. I frankly did not see anything wrong with Pat Buchanan's speech in 1992. And if you read it, you wonder what all the hullabaloo was about. If you read Zell Miller's speech, which I have, you know what all the whole of the Lewis about. Pete in Knoxville, Tennessee says, As you may know, the Libertarian Party typically is not very competitive in any of the 50 states. It's become clear that the various state Libertarian parties, for the most part, simply do not have any intent to be competitive in the political scenario. What can be done to inspire or invoke the state and local Libertarian parties to become more competitive? Uh, Pete, I think you have it all wrong. They are all trying to be more competitive, but the odds, uh, the, the game is stacked against them. Uh, the ballot access laws mean that it's very unlikely that they are going to have much money available to advertise, to get their message before the people in a mass way, because so much money has to be spent just getting on the ballot. And because the media people know that the libertarians have little chance of electing somebody, then uh, they don't give much attention, because they know they're not going to have an important effect upon the outcome of the race. The amazing thing is that there are... I don't know what the current figure is now, but something like seven or 800 libertarians in office around the country in local offices, uh, some even mayors of small cities and many on city councils and so forth. So it isn't that they are not trying to be competitive. They are accomplishing a great deal in spite of some very, very severe handicaps that are placed on them by Republicans and Democrats in the state legislatures. But, Pete, if you really want them to be even more competitive, then you should join a local libertarian party and bring to it whatever skills and talents you have. All right, back to the phones. Let's talk with Joe in Virginia. Good evening, Joe. Good evening, Harry. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Um, this is the only negative thing I'll say tonight, I hope. <laughs> All right. Uh, Zell Miller made Howard Dean look completely sane. <laughs> I never thought that there was anything wrong with Howard Dean. Obviously, I don't agree with his views on health care and all that, but that so-called rant the night that he lost in Iowa or wherever it was, I didn't see anything wrong with that at all. I thought he was just cheerleading. And, of course, uh, it is things are what people say they are rather than what they really are. And so that will uh, dog Howard Dean for the rest of his life as though he had lost his temper, as though he had gone into some kind of an epileptic fit. Uh, whatever uh, the point is, that I didn't see anything wrong with it, but people saw it as an opportunity to jump on him and make fun of him. No, you're right, you're right. I do want to say something. You're giving us a nice lesson tonight, I think, in how to approach being a better libertarian. And, and I've been a libertarian now for 25 years, 1979, and um, I look back uh, on those years, a lot of it with regret, with the way I approach things. Um, and it's only been in the last few years that I've changed the way that I've approached the way I talk libertarianism with other people. I always found myself on the defensive, having to prove that freedom was right, having to show how the Constitution was the way we should work our, uh, our government and our country, rather than treating libertarianism and freedom as the natural state of things and allowing other people to show me where I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds really simple, but it took me a long time to come to that uh, uh, kind of understanding. And well, not everybody is going to agree with you right off the bat that liberty is the natural state of things, and if you try to show them philosophically by building a case for that, you are going to find that it founders on the simple problem that any time you try to talk about natural rights or what the natural state of things are or should be, you will have to at some point take something on faith that there is some part of it that cannot be proved. Ayn Rand said that we should always look for man qua man, meaning uh, everything should be what is natural to human beings. But you, if you had to take her faithful definition of what man as man was, but what you can do is to say, look, there are two ways of doing this. We either uh, do it through liberty or we do it through government. Now, everything that we enjoy in life, the house we live in, the, the cars that we drive, the VCRs that we use, the television we watch, all of these things were created through liberty through people freely, voluntarily interacting with each other. Everything that's difficult today, our bad education system, our bad health care system, uh, the wars that are fought, the, the problems, the federal debt, 
All of these things have been created through government. Now, would you prove to me why this government program that you think is so great or that you want to see passed is going to be an exception to the rule whereby liberty produces good things and government produces bad things? Uh, and and with that, I'm with you. True. And, and another thing is I, I found in, in discussing these uh, issues with people is that we come to common understanding uh, of certain uh, points. Uh, where is force valid? Uh, I think a lot of people who you would not think would agree with you will actually agree that force is valid almost nowhere yes. uh, in, in everyday point. life. You know, you don't go into uh, you, go, you don't go to your landlord and point a gun at him and say the rent this month is two hundred and twenty-five dollars. Uh, however, um, what stops you from going down to city hall and saying we should have a rent control act that says rent is two hundred and seventy-five dollars? Same thing. People will agree if you put things in that in that perspective. I think. Very, very good point, Joe. And I think you're really on the right track. Thanks so much for calling Thank and uh, giving your giving us your wisdom. Well, let's go right back to the phones and talk with Jonathan in that great cultural center of America known as Washington, D.C. Good evening, Jonathan. Hey, Harry. What's up? Not too much. Uh, are you soaking up a lot of culture and wisdom there from all the people around you? There, there's always a lot of uh, culture in D.C. as long as you can uh, block the politicians out of it. But uh, I agree with your approach with selling uh, libertarianism, although I think it, you gave Ayn Rand kind of short trip in that last uh, segment there. G well, I, I have a great deal of respect for Ayn Rand, and I probably should have made that point clear. It's just that I believe that any time you try to deal with rights, you have to realize that you are dealing with faith at some point because you have to have a self-evident premise from which to start an argument on behalf of a right to something, whatever it is, whether it's liberty or to a job or whatever your particular point of view is, and uh, there's no getting around that. There is no well, nothing uh, that is self-evident to everybody. Okay, I, I will say that I, I disagree with you there. If you, I don't know how uh, knowledgeable you are about uh, her philosophy, but uh, her her philosophy is based on certain axioms that are undeniable, and I, I don't think that anything she said is uh, you have to take on faith. In well, no, wait a second, uh, Jonathan. They are undeniable to you, and they may even be acceptable to me, but they are not so self-evident to everybody in the world, and you have to get, you, you can only use these axioms with somebody who agrees that they really are axioms, that they are self-evident truths. Well, well I don't want to get into an argument about objectivism. Uh, I will say that it was based on her, her, uh, her view of man as a thinking being, which is what ob objectively differentiates a human being from every other uh, animal, and uh, although, like I said, I don't think discussing uh, objectivist philosophy or anything like that is the best way to convince anyone of, uh, of freedom because it just takes too much uh, logical uh, integration and most people aren't willing to uh, put forth that kind of effort. But anyway, uh, I wanted to say amen to your uh, comments in your opening segment about Rudy Giuliani. Sometimes being a libertarian, I feel like I'm in some kind of a bizarre world <laughs> where people, things that are so obvious... Just you and Jerry Seinfeld. Are along. <laughs> <laughs> things that are so obvious to me uh, the other people are just not seeing at all, and Rudy Giuliani is a perfect example. I grew up on Long Island, a uh, suburb of New York City, and uh, I always thought that Rudy Giuliani was one of the most self-important, grandstanding, publicity-seeking politicians <laughs> that I knew of. And the, the events since 9-11 have just confirmed everything I already thought. Um, and yet all these other people, uh, from when I go back home, are talking about how Rudy Giuliani is such a hero for doing what anyone who was, would have, uh, if they were mayor of New York City, would have done. Uh, I just... It's just so uh, irritating to me. And now he's getting, like, as you said in your opening uh, segment, enormous speaking fees for talking about uh, leadership. leadership. Yeah. And it's just, uh, I can't bear it. And that's a good reason why I could not, I didn't tune in for any of the Republican convention or any of the Democratic convention because, uh, it's like painful. you said, it's just masochistic. <laughs> that's all I really wanted to say. Well, I appreciate that very much. And uh, you heard it yourself, folks, firsthand from somebody from New York City. <laughs> thanks, thanks so much, Jonathan. All right, let's talk now with Matthew in Massachusetts. Good evening, Matthew. Hey, Mr. Brown, how are you doing? Just fine. What's I've up? Got, I've got all kinds of great positive libertarian things to tell you about. Um, For example? Yes. Yeah, I've just recently joined two libertarian things that one is called Libertarian Meetups, and I was thinking you should put them on a radio link on your site, uh, the Libertarian Party Meetup. Uh, I'm not sure what this what the link is for you. I can email it to you. Is it uh, like a dating exchange? No, it's not a, not a dating exchange, but it's a... It's where just you know groups of libertarians meet. They meet in real life, and they, they get together online mm -hmm. to meet in real life. So it's like a bulletin board that tells exactly. you where and when. Exactly, and, and actually did I went to one of these and um, and had a great time. And is, is it a local Massachusetts thing or nationwide? It's nationwide. Oh, that's and, interesting. Well, send me the link when you I, when you find it. I will. And I went. I went to this. It was just a lot of fun getting together, uh, getting energized, uh, meeting with local libertarians, and uh, discussing things. And now we're going to you know support uh, Michael Bodnarik and. Uh, doing all kind, you know, and I, I got to push your show there, so oh, good. <laughs> yeah, your website. And um, uh, one, one, a woman that came by was surprised that you weren't running for president. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
the, the, second, the perennial candidates. Right. <laughs> well, who is this? Why is it, so Mr. Brown isn't running for president this year? Yeah. 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 He's got to have a life of his own sometime, you know. But um, And uh, the second thing was that I thought, you know, I signed up for the Free State Project, uh, which is, I'm not sure if you're aware of. I'm, sure. I'm, yeah, you, I'm sure you're aware of it. And uh, um, I've made a, uh, a proclamation that I'm going to, me and Dealing are going to move to, uh, to New Hampshire within the next two years. Oh, you are? Are you going to go across the state line? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to go to a, a place where there's actual liberty. Um, How does this, will this affect your work? Well, it, I'm, you know, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be looking for work out there, and but uh, we're hopefully going to move someplace that's closer to it. New Hampshire is, is quite close to Boston. It's, in, it's in approximately 40 to 45 minute drive, mm -hmm. and you can, also there's a train that you can take. And, and people commute to Boston, I know, from New Hampshire. Exactly, exactly. So it's not going to affect us too much, because uh, Healing also works in Boston. Uh, but it's a, it's a great opportunity to... Uh, make a state that's all considered to be the freest state in the union to be even more libertarian, and uh, to uh, work that way. Um, and plus, we just love New Hampshire. It's very. If you go there, it's, you really feel the, the quantitative, you know, liberty. It, it's it's just it's very noticeable different. You know, it's like walking from fog into light. You know, it's a mm -hmm. very very nice experience. Well, that's good. Yeah, and uh, so it's two very two great things that are that's two libertarian things that are going on that I think everyone should know about. Is you know, free state project and uh, libertarian meetups so you can get get together with other libertarians in your area. Um, I'll send you both those links. Good. I'm glad to hear about yeah. it, and I uh, I wish you the uh, the best of everything, and I hope uh, hope it does not create too much of an inconvenience in your life. No, not at all. And uh, so there's some great libertarian, positive libertarian things there for you. Good. Yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Matthew. I appreciate hearing from you. I have an email from Craig, who says I am curious if you have read or have heard of a book called Generations, written by William Strauss and Neil ha Neil Howe in 1991. If you have, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the show tonight. The premise of the book is that there are four types of generations and four types of phases within a generational cycle that have transpired almost identically throughout American history since the early 1600s. And I will not read the entire email, but the point of it is that there are certain cycles that apparently a nation, especially this nation, goes through and that we are now just starting what he calls a crisis era, which began in 2003 and will last until 2005. The height or peak of most anxiety should be around 2013 to 2024. For comparison, past crisis eras have included the American Revolution and the Depression in World War II. I look at a few things and realize that we are in the early stages of some serious changes that will have to be made over the next 10 years. Any sites increase in oil demand with a decrease in oil supply, boomers beginning to retire in 2011, terrorism, war, corrupt government officials, empire, declining dollar. And he says something has to break at some point. Can you comment? Yes, I'll comment. Eek! Well... Uh, take two aspirin. Well, in fact, better yet, Greg, take a tranquilizer. Uh, people for thousands of years have been trying to compartmentalize history into cycles, into repeatable patterns that create a wave that goes through prosperity and then depression, uh, through war and then peace and so forth. And certainly, these things do rotate, but they do not do so on any given schedule. Uh, back in the 1980s, starting well, actually starting in the late 70s, anybody in the investment world heard about the dreaded Kondratiev wave. A Soviet scientist had written a book for his Soviet masters indicating that the United States was headed into a Great Depression in the 1980s because there was a wave, which is the same thing as saying a cycle, pretty much the same thing, and that there, I believe it was a 70-year cycle that the U.S. had gone through, and it was now ready to go through. A, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't 70. It was about 50 years, 55 years, something like that. Uh, I have forgotten all about it because it was so inconsequential. But in any event, it was now time for the U.S. to plunge into a terrible depression, and many investment advisors believed this and cautioned their clients to to do this out of the other thing. Well, of course, the Kondratiev wave uh, is not talked about anymore because none of the things that it predicted came true, just as none of the things that are ever predicted by cycles or waves come true. Anybody can take history and pick out certain things and put it into the thesis and say, see, here's where the good things were and here's where the bad things were. And you do that by ignoring the bad things when you're recounting the good things and ignoring the good things when you're recounting the bad things. Human action does not work on a time schedule because human beings are not electrons or molecules who are the same at all times and are the same one for, from another. Human beings change continually as they grow and learn and do new things. And as a result, history may repeat itself in that we have war and then peace for a while and then war and so forth, but it never repeats itself on any predictable schedule. Even when we go back to war again, it's a completely different kind of war from the one before. The similarities between World War I and World War II are very, very few, and they are comprised almost entirely of the fact that the same kinds of lies got us into World War II as got us into World War I. 
But the war itself was completely different. It was waged in a completely different way. And the characteristics of it were completely different. And the conclusion of it was completely different. And the post-war period was completely different. And so none of the things that were learned from how World War I proceeded were of much value as predictions for World War II. And this is the nature of things. And this is why, incidentally, government is unable to produce the results promised for it because every government program is based upon the past about this is what happened before so all we have to do is take steps to counteract the bad part of what happened before using the force of government to impose these consequences on people and we won't have any more trouble but in the meantime people are changing their behavior and the people who are forced to pay for this grand government program find ways of slipping out of paying for it or the people who are supposed to be regulated by it find ways of slipping around the regulations and the people who were supposed to benefit from this are multiplied many times over when other people see that there's free money available so the supply isn't there as intended and the demand is far greater than was intended well, we talked about a lot of things tonight, and one of the things that I like to keep coming back to is taking the positive approach. And that positive pro approach means talking about liberty to people just as much as we talk about government. Whenever we talk about the bad things that government is doing, we should flip that around to the other side of the coin and talk about all the wonderful things that could be if we just got rid of those bad things, if the government were no longer doing whatever it was we were just talking about, whether it has to do with health care, education, prosecutors, war, whatever it may be, we need to keep focusing in on the plus side. One of the callers tonight pointed out that it is difficult to talk with people about philosophy, and I agree, and not just because philosophy involves self-evident truths that not everybody are, will agree on, but simply, as Jonathan pointed out, that people don't want to wade through philosophical discussions sometimes. There is a great deal that you can talk about with people after you have their interests up. But the first thing you have to do is get their attention. And unlike the old joke, you don't do it by hitting somebody with a two-by-four. You do it by talking about how much better their lives could be. And to me, music is such an inspiring thing. And as I hear that music starting in the background, I think, well, this music tells it all. The positive nature of life. And... It is that positive nature that's going to win this battle for us if we are going to win it. I hope you'll be back next week. This is Harry Brown. Do something for yourself this week. Good night.